Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Madam Chair, I just wanted to say I still uh, teach a class at three on Thursdays, so I'm going to have to leave after the first hour of this. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Councillor Flynn, just checking in to see if uh, I think you had uh, mentioned potentially uh, Someone from CPA also joining us today? Councillor Flynn? You're, you're muted, Ed. Okay, yeah. Hi, Councillor Edwards. Yeah, right. Let me check with CPA and let me see what the status is, okay? Okay. Um, I know folks do have some, um, some time constraints. Is everyone here from the administration? I had. Dominique, Katie, and Tim. I see Katie and Tim. Is Dominique joining us shortly? Uh, she should be, yeah, I'll text her right now. Okay, cool. We'll just give two more minutes and then we'll start. Uh, and we'll see if, if uh, Lydia or Karen from CPA or any other person is joining us from um, advocate community and then we'll just go. Okay, I see. So, Taylor. All right, I see that we have about 11 people in the waiting room. Let me just go ahead. Councilor O'Malley's doing this. Uh, let's see. All right, admitted everyone in the waiting room. Yeah, Dominique said she was in the waiting room. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dominique, are you there? Uh, just want to make sure that we had all the folks from the administration. And then on terms of, good to see you all. I have Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, Councillor O'Malley. Of course, and I have two more people joining. Zoe from GOS, okay. Okay. Dominique's the screen name with the numbers. We I'm turn the key. door. What's wrong with this? <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Uh, can hear you. Can't see you. Unless anyone else can see her. Yeah, I guess that's okay. Um, just not sure what's going on with it. Okay, Dom. All right, cool. Then, so we have Dominique Williams, uh, Katie, and Tim Davis are here from the administration, right? Uh, and Taylor Kane. And Taylor Kane, my apologies. And Taylor Kane, Dominique, and Tim, and Katie. And we have our, we have some folks from the, Michael Kane is also, okay. All right. Well, it looks like we're getting a lot of folks to join in real quick. All right.
All right, so we're just going to go ahead and start or start as folks join into the waiting room. Um, Carrie, who is uh, with Central Staff, will let you in. Um, this is going to be a good one. Okay, all right then. So what I'm going to do is just tell you tell folks how this is going to operate. Um, what I'll very likely do is uh, I will I will open with a uh, quick remarks. I will turn it over to the co um, uh, per, or to Councilor Flynn, who is who also filed legislation or a hearing order as well for tenants' rights, and then uh, the city councils will each kind of open up or have some very brief remarks if they choose to have them. Then, then the administration will go ahead and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the in the topic of tenants' rights, or in my case, um, talking specifically about this new rent assistance program that they have, and give out some general information, um, and then. We will uh, go through questions. Um, I believe people, if you have questions to ask, you can raise your hands on this uh, application. And I will just go through, and we've been joined by Councilor Slavi George, and we will be able to um, call on people to speak. And, and because of the platform and because of our uh, the way things are going, we're gonna ask everyone to be as brief as possible, um, not so much with statements, but direct questions to the administration uh, about the program or about tenants' rights. But at this point, I, th I think because of the limited ways in which we are trying to communicate, we're gonna ask people to really uh, keep their comment, their questions down to um, no, no more than a minute. Normally we're allowed two to three in, in person. So uh, we've been joined by, uh, again, so let me uh, go ahead and open up this formal hearing, excuse me. I keep getting people joining in, but I wanted to make sure I did this formally. I have, just again, I have Councillor Flynn up. Uh, I have Councillor Flynn, Councillor Bach, Councillor Mejia, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Braden. Are there any other city councillors that have joined? that I didn't mention. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this meeting. Um, formally starting it, I use my water bottle instead of the gavel. So here we go, we heard that. Um, my name is Lydia Edwards. I'm the chair of the Housing and uh, Community Development Committee. Uh, for the city of Boston. I am here uh, also joined by my colleague, Councillor Flynn. Uh, both of us filed different um, hearing orders. Councillor Flynn initially filed a hearing order to specifically talk about uh, the support tenants uh, need to face eviction and displacement in the city of Boston. And I filed a hearing order specifically to discuss the creation of a temporary rental assistance program to support residents impacted by COVID-19. For a matter of efficiency, instead of having two separate hearings, we decided to combine those to have this uh, conversation to get today. Uh, we did not, when we filed, well, Councillor Flynn, when he initially filed, did not assume that we were gonna be facing a pandemic, but uh, many of us are still faced in trying to deal with that issue. And at the same time of us having this conversation, I don't know if people are watching the State House, uh, we're wondering if they will pass the uh, landmark legislation that would hopefully end evictions during the pandemic and also end uh, mortgage um, foreclosures as well, moratorium on both, um, both of which this uh, city council has come out in favor of. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn, or just want to note that this is an important conversation, that this is not a new conversation for many of the people who are in the struggle and fight right now. Um, we had a housing crisis before the pandemic. For many people, we were already dealing with a six, seven, eight alarm fire, and this pandemic really just poured gasoline on it. And so a lot of the issues that we are dealing with were, we were dealing with before, but at such a level of urgency. Um, that we didn't have. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that this is not a criticism at all of how we are trying to handle this. This is really looking at the programs that we're offering and hopefully together coming up with additional resources that the city of Boston, city council can come up with to not only deal with this pandemic, um, but also dealing with the housing crisis going forward. I think um, urgency is sometimes the um, one of the uh, 
gifts for, or at least assures that we will be more creative in how we deal with things going forward. And everyone has been made very abundantly clear, we cannot continue as we were before this pandemic in many, many uh, facets of government. So I'm gonna end that and I'm gonna turn it over to Councillor Flynn for some opening remarks. And then I will go down the list of folks of councillors for any opening remarks or statements if they so choose. Councillor Flynn. You're on mute. Can we, okay. Thank you, Council Edwards, for your partnership on this hearing. During this critical time, we thought that this hearing would be a good vehicle for us to discuss how we can continue to protect tenants in a city, especially now that this pandemic has caused many people to lose their jobs and income, and also now to look at risk of losing their housing. I still believe that this is an important conversation to have, and I suspect it will be one that we'll continue to discuss in our city. I also understand over 16 million Americans have filed for unemployment in the last three weeks. Our immediate focus right now is to prevent displacement in housing and make sure that our tenants will be able to stay in their homes during this crisis. With the closure of many businesses due to the pandemic, many renters have lost their income and may be at risk of losing their housing due to financial constraints. Losing housing during a pandemic would be extremely difficult to the health and safety of so many tenants in Boston and our country. Again, I wanna say thank you to Council Edwards. I wanna say thank you to Mayor Walsh and his administration for your great work on this difficult issue. And I'm looking forward to hearing from tenants advocates across our city to learn more about ways we can prevent displacement that will happen over Boston. Thank you, uh, Councilor Edwards. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. My apologies and my rush to get this started. I forgot to read the formal language, the docket numbers, and also <laughs> explaining uh, the ways in which you can be watching this. So let me just go back to note that the docket numbers that we are discussing today are 0218, order for hearing to discuss ways to support tenants facing eviction and docket 0587 order for a hearing regarding the creation of a temporary rental assistance uh, support to support residents impacted by COVID-19. Um, the city council uh, has a quorum and today to discuss but also wanted to let people know formally the reason why we're doing this on Zoom is due to the declaration of a state of emergency in the state of Massachusetts and as a result all of our public meetings due to an abundance of caution are done through remote uh, means. The public may watch this hearing via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city council dash tv. It will also be rebroadcast at a later date on Comcast 8, R say, R, excuse me, RCN 82 Verizon 1964. As I mentioned earlier, public testimony will be accepted here today, but we're asking those uh, to raise their hand formally on this app. I will go through the names that I see also on this app, and we're asking people to limit their testimony to real questions, not so much statements, and also uh, to no more than a minute. My apologies, um, Councillor Bach. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to thank you and Councillor Flynn uh, for having submitted these dockets and uh, uh, bringing up this important conversation. I think, you know, we were all cheered by the city's uh, introduction last week of uh, emergency rental relief, um, you know, $3 million through DND to help particularly those who are not being helped by the um, federal uh, options and who maybe don't qualify for unemployment and such. But I think we all know that that's just the tip of the iceberg um, mm -hmm. and that we are facing a really, um, really huge intractable situation here. Um, and that, as you said, it comes on top of a situation where we already had lots of people who were rent burdened, who were on the verge of eviction, who you know were not able to keep stable housing. And so um, it's just so important in this, in this pandemic, you know, we're dealing with a public health emergency that we know then has a whole nother wave of economic um, redevelopment that's gonna have to happen. But in the public health emergency in this moment where we're looking at going into 
you know, a surge of our hospital capacity, the number one things that we need to make sure that everyone has to, in order to be safe right now are food and shelter. Um, and, and we really can't have that be threatened for people. Um, so I agree with you that I'm also on tenor hooks waiting to see what the, uh, what the state house is going to do today. Um, and mm -hmm. really, really hopeful that a strong moratorium comes through that, um, that lifts some of that anxiety for people because there's so much anxiety in the air anyways. Um, and I'll say that there was also some data that came out today showing us um, a just enormous off the charts increase last week in SNAP applications right. um, and other emergency assistance, which I think is a, a pretty good tell for people who are also going to be suddenly unable to pay their rent. Um, and we all know that this is, it's a chain reaction, right? And that we've got property owners who are on the hook for bills that they're planning to pay with that rent and that everything is kind of interconnected here. Um, and so I think as we think of this as a city about what we do there, we know that big pieces of this are going to have to be done at the federal and state level. Um, but I think we have to be really smart about what we can do with city resources to fill the gaps and what we can do to push some of our larger agendas around, um, around tenants' rights and around protecting uh, the people most likely to um, lose housing in our city. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation. I think that I've thought for a long time that, uh, you know, the Office of Housing Stability is a great resource, that we need more housing resources in the city. Um, and I hope that we'll come out of uh, this situation uh, with an even more robust um, apparatus on that front than we had before. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also been joined by Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Mejia, do you have any opening remarks or? Feel free. Thank you, Madam Chair um, and Councillor Flynn uh, for convening this hearing. Looking forward to engaging in the dialogue. Um, what I happen to, to find um, startling and, and it's not as a result of COVID-19 is, is I think it's creating an opportunity for us to really put a, magnif um, a magnifying glass on, on the issues that have been chronic here in the city of Boston. The fact that, you know, people are living seven or eight seven or eight people in one apartment because they can't even afford to live. Here in the city of Boston speaks volumes to why this conversation is so important. Um, what, I, what I am really concerned about are the, a lot of the low wage workers who are now, who are lucky enough to receive unemployment benefits, but those unemployment benefits, um, if you're a low wage worker, you're lucky if you're gonna be getting $300 a, month, a week to survive. Mm -hmm. And when that is the case, um, it's only $1,200 a month. And if your rent mm -hmm. is, um, you know, double that, um, you know, there you're gonna see a lot more people uh, facing this this um, situation. And so really looking forward to uplifting the voices of, the of those who are gonna be most impacted and bringing to light that a lot of the issues that I'm seeing here in the city of Boston, a lot of it is in terms of access to information, um, language access, and, and how, we, how do we have this conversation in a way that folks um, can actually access it is also as equally as important to me. So looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you for um, hosting and here we go. Thank you very much. Moving to Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you also through you to the uh, maker of the similar order, Councillor Flynn and to all my colleagues and most importantly, all members of the public who joined us today. Um, obviously it's most important we hear from them. I also wanted to acknowledge the incredible work of uh, Mayor Walsh and his housing team specifically, the number of individuals that we will hear from shortly for being nimble, for reacting um, so swiftly as I think we're all trying to do. Uh, this is an unprecedented event that we find ourselves in the midst of. This is the most challenging thing uh, most of us have ever had to deal with and God willing will be the most challenging thing any of us will have to deal with going forward. Uh, and obviously the ramifications of uh, the coronavirus outbreak and the impact on health, on housing, on safety, on, on just every, every metric that we look at is going to continue to unravel. Um, and obviously one of the things that we can do in the short term is everything within our power to make sure there is safe housing available for individuals and that folks aren't displaced and aren't evicted during these uh, just unimaginable time. So it is an extraordinary time and it's going to take some extraordinary measures mm -hmm. to deal with this. So I know that we as a body are united working with our mayor to doing everything we can 
Um, and again, I value the opportunity to have hearings like this so we can hear directly from folks, uh, many of whom are being impacted to make sure that we come up with policies and proposals that make sense and are as, are as ecumenical as humanly possible. So uh, thank you, that's, that's it for my statement, but just wanted to uh, give uh, all my best to everyone who's, who's participating via Zoom and who may be watching online. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Estesabi George? If Anissa is still here. Yeah, thank you uh, very Excellent. much uh, to both uh, Chair Edwards and Councillor uh, Flynn for your leadership in this space. I too, um, as has been stated, look forward to uh, this hearing and in particular hearing from uh, public testimony. I do want to give a, uh, a special credit to the Office of Housing Stability. They've been an incredible partner uh, with my work, especially around families experiencing homelessness. And considering the time that we're in, there is um, a certain level of comfort that I have knowing that I'm stably housed. And we need to create that environment for all of our families and all of our residents across the city of Boston. So look forward to the hearing, look forward in particular to the public testimony and the work ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have Councillor Braden. Hi. I'd just like to thank uh, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Flynn for their leadership on this issue. This is a very important hearing and we're in a very, very critical time right now. Uh, basic human needs for, for shelter and food are, and safety are right at the top of our um, concerns right now. And I really think this is a very important hearing. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing testimony from all those who are um, who are going to we're going to hear from this afternoon thank you thank you very much so we and i believe councillor flaherty is listening in he he is not i think in a place where he can be muted yet but he will text me if he wants to um if he has any questions but he wanted to acknowledge that he is here uh listening um so i wanted to uh also introduce formally the the folks representing the administration uh, Ms. Dominic Williams is the Director of the Office of Housing Stability. Uh, uh, Ms. Katie Ford is, I believe, the Operations Manager for uh, Office of Housing Stability. Um, I have also um, Taylor Kane from the Housing Innovation Lab and Tim, Dam Tim Davis, who's the Policy Director now for DND. Did I get everyone correct? Yes. I hope so. Okay. Um, so they're going to, um, I'm going to allow for, you know, two, maybe two minutes, no more than that for you guys to kind of generally talk a little bit about the two buckets that we're dealing with is, which is about tenants rights and displacement and maybe creative response. But also if you want to give a quick orientation to the, um, and I'm trying to get you all on the same screen, um, to the, uh, housing rent relief, um, uh, temporary rent relief program that is now, um, I guess, ex been accepting applications all week. And maybe you can give us some umbrella um, numbers, in terms of applicants, uh, what's, you know, timeline for when the checks will go out, average amounts, things like that. And uh, I'll let you be broad like that. And then if we need to get more narrow, that'll get narrowed down through the city councilors asking questions. And then we'll go from city councilors right into the, um, to, to write it to the general public so they can come in as well. And we'll just have a conversation. I think we have a small enough group that we can do that. And if it gets out of hand, I'll mute everybody and we'll start again, okay? Um, Councilor, I'm sorry. Uh, Dom, sorry. Um, Ms, Ms. I was gonna have OHS, no. Tim? No, I, I'm gonna start off. Go ahead, this Tim. is Tim David. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Flynn for sponsoring these uh, hearings. Uh, this is Tim Davis. I'm the Deputy Director for Policy Development and Research. Um, in the interest of time, there was part of our opening statement that I'll kind of jump over, but I wanted to thank you for giving us this opportunity to engage in this very important discussion about housing stability of Boston's renters. Just as you are acknowledging the challenges renters already faced before the onset of the COVID-19 crisis, by bringing together Councilor Friend's request and Councillor Edwards' request relevant to the crisis, our comments will address both the immediate crisis and the overall challenges we face. Okay. Um, as you all are probably aware that we have had the Boston 20 Housing 2030 plan. Um, I will skip over for the moment some of the details of that plan and our process and what we have accomplished to date. You can find that on the DND website. So in interest of time, so I'm gonna jump directly 
to Dominique to talk about the increasing of tenant protections work that we've been doing uh, before this crisis. Yes, thank you very much, um, Tim, and also to Councillor Edwards and Councillor Flynn for allowing us the opportunity to amplify uh, this tenant um, protection fund that we've put into place. So I wanted to kind of start by giving a little bit uh, of, about the work that we do. I know uh, Councillor Bach and Councillor uh, Asabi George were both very, very um, friendly in terms of talking about the efforts that we've um, helped their office um, with. Um, but I also wanted to um, just give a little bit of an overview of the tenant protections that we had in place prior to this COVID crisis. So our efforts to increase the supply of, of income restricted housing is important, um, but so is the effort to help individuals who are um, currently housed to stay in their homes. Um, this hearing request also, I think, focuses on tenant protections in general, including legal representation. So of course the administration, the, the Mayor Walsh's administration is in full support of two, two bills at the State House that would increase tenant protections. And um, our office has, since uh, I've been there, has passionately supported two key pieces of legislation that are currently pending at the House. Um, H3373, an act relative to the just cause eviction of elderly leases is a local option bill sponsored by Rep Madaro. The bill seeks to end no fault evictions for tenants over the age of 75 and to prevent rent increases uh, on those tenants um, of more than 5% uh, year over year. So because we know that elders are generally unable to increase their income and they're more at risk for eviction if rent is increased, um, and we know that they would ultimately be displaced from neighborhoods that they know or love, we've really been pushing for this protection to be enacted. Um, Tenant protections for both provisions of this bill would only kick in when a landlord owns six units or more. Um, and according to BPDA data from 2019, about 8,800 households uh, in Boston over the age of 75 would be protected if that bill was enacted. Uh, the second set of bills that OHS has been supportive of um, originated in the House and the Senate as um, Senate Bill 913 and House Bill 3456, an act to ensure the right to counsel and eviction proceedings. There were three separate bills that were proposed um, this session at the State House in this regard, and OHS has been working with a coalition of over 150 organizations to submit a combined bill that brings to together the best of what was already proposed. Um, the reconciled bill would provide for full legal representation of tenants and owner occupants of two family homes during an eviction process or a foreclosure proceeding. Um, now uh, we're more than ever, of course, based on this COVID crisis, we know that people will need representation to defend their right to maintain a safe and stable housing. And so we're committed to helping to push those two pieces of legislation. Um, I guess I'll also just now skip down to the section where we talk a little bit about the rental relief fund. Mm -hmm. So for this, uh, for the past week, um, Monday, Mayor Walsh launched the rental relief fund with an initial $3 million infusion of city dollars. Uh, we already have seen 4,467 households apply as of uh, close of business yesterday. Um, we're targeting those, uh, those relief funds to tenants who are either not eligible to receive unemployment assistance or whose job type means that they may not receive um, sufficient unemployment benefits to replace their lost income. Uh, qualified residents will earn um, less than 80% of the AMI, which is approximately $73,000 for a two-person household. Um, eligible households can receive up to $4,000 of small rent payments um, owed to preserve their tenancies or to access new permanent housing by paying at least a portion of their first and, first and last month and security deposit. Um, we decided to hold a lottery given the fact that we've had so many applicants over such a short period of time um, in order to help to prioritize those services as well as to make sure that the process is a little bit more fair. Um, currently, um, DND is working very hard to find additional funds that may be able to assist um, because we know that the, 
the volume of applicants is, is um, certainly very high and uh, much higher than just the $3 million would support. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to both Katie, my colleagues, Katie Ford and Taylor Kane to talk a little bit more about language access as well as the specific process for the lottery. Yeah, great. Thank you again to Councillor Edwards and Councillor Flynn for convening this group. So one of the things that we really recognize is that language access is a crucial dimension of, of all of our efforts and particularly this one. And we are really looking at different ways to ensure that it is a priority in this process. So the pre-screening forms that are currently available on the Rental Relief Fund website are available in six different languages. So English, Spanish, Chinese, Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole, and Vietnamese. And then also the application form um, that those selected in the lottery process will complete will also be available in those six languages. The partner agencies that we that who will be working with applicants um, have staff who have the ability to speak seven different languages. And so in addition to thinking about language access, we have also been thinking about uh, households that don't have reliable access to internet or computer. And so offering the ability for folks to call in and complete the screening materials on the phone um, with staff from the Office of Housing Stability. Uh, and we are increasing or have increased our staffing capacity to respond to the, to the rising number of incoming calls and voicemails. We are very much keenly aware of the significant need for the financial assistance that the Rental Relief Fund will provide to folks. And we are working really hard, as hard as possible to get this essential resource out into the hands of residents as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I just I just wanted to say briefly piggybacking off of what Taylor just said that um, typically OHS, the Office of Housing Stability, sees about uh, 400 or to 500 calls a month. In the last week, we've received over a thousand. So um, we've definitely had staff on board to make sure that nobody falls through the gaps. We have people checking all the emails that we receive, and we're making sure that nobody falls through the cracks on top of our addition, our usual constituent advocacy and work around housing. Um, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Flynn, I just also wanted to take the time to thank you for holding this hearing. It's very important. And, um, you know, I have worked with your staff on brainstorming on how to help constituents during these times before COVID-19. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing to working with your staff on that as well. I just wanted to briefly let people know that last year in 2019, prior to this crisis, uh, OHS was able to prevent 756 evictions. And so we've we've been working hard around this space for a very long time, as you know, and um, we're looking forward to answering any more questions that you have about what we've been doing. And before we go into questions, I want just a minute or two about the funding uh, mm -hmm. fund framework. So the Federal CARES Act provides significant resources to unemployment benefits, one-time payments, and rental supports for housing authorities and voucher holders which will keep many renters stabilized. The CARES Act also provides significant CDBG funding and emergency shelter grant funding to the city. We're expecting approximately 25 million to the CDBG, which can be used for housing and economic development, and approximately 20 million for emergency shelter grants. Some of that money is available now, some of that will be available in the future. Uh, we will use this to assure the health, safety, and housing stability of some of our lowest income residents. We are also aware of how this crisis is disparately impacting people of color. Black and Latino Bostonians are more likely than whites to be in jobs where we have seen the most layoffs. Chief among them, accommodation and food services, retail trade, construction, and transportation and warehousing. Undocumented workers are also concentrated in these same industries, and Asians are highly concentrated in the accommodation and food service industries. While the federal government is working quickly to get these funds out the door and is waiving some of the regulations, we are concerned that unemployment benefits, CDBG funds, et cetera, will not do enough to secure housing stability for households with mostly cash income, including the city's 18,000 undocumented workers and or these funds will not come fast enough. So that's one reason why we move forward with a $3 million fund, but we are already working to add additional funds. On Monday, the Neighborhood Housing Trust, of which Councillor Edwards is a member, took an important vote to provide up to $5 million in funding for the affordable housing projects we have in our pipeline so we can keep those projects moving while shifting up to $5 million from our more flexible funding sources to the rental relief funds. We're also looking at the incoming CDBG funds to further shore up this effort. We are also concerned that many families could face eviction before needed funds are available. 
This is why the mayor has been pressing the legislature for an eviction and foreclosure moratorium. As has already been mentioned on this call by, other, by the councilors, there is Bill H4617, which we think that there may be a passage of this bill in the Senate anytime, and we are monitoring that. So again, thank you for your opportunity for us to speak with you today, and we are available for questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and kick off some of the questions um, to go um, directly into the fund. Um, so um, we heard that there have been 4,467 uh, people applying for grants up to $4,000. When this was initially launched, then was, how many people did you expect to apply? And maybe I'll just do several questions at once that way, you know, whatever. So there's no fight. So I'm curious, what were you expecting $3 million to do about if you were looking at the, the, the three, that's one. Number two, are you, are you paying this money in one lump sum? just up to whatever and one-time payment. Number three, um, I am curious about any tenant protections that you are going to provide. The funding is going to go to uh, the landlords as I understand it, but are the landlords going to commit to A, not raising the rent, B, not, um, uh, not evicting the tenants even after the pandemic, if they're on a month-to-month -month list, are there any strings gonna be attached to that? Um, are there any limits on how many checks or how many fund, how many units a, a landlord can get? You know, are we dealing with just the small property owners? Are we dealing with the MG2s, the city realties, who may have multiple um, tenants and multiple multiple um, checks, I guess, to come in? And then uh, I'm curious as to why um, the federal stimulus payments were considered as one of the income factors. Um, when we don't know when they're gonna arrive for a lot of people. And also uh, the information indicates that the first payments will be direct deposited to sometime in April. Um, for those who have bank account information online, other people sometimes are most vulnerable who are not online, who don't file online, will be getting uh, written checks months, we don't know when. So just curious, you know, we. The, the assumption is that aid's coming, but it's not coming anytime soon. So there are a lot of people who do need help um, who are getting them. And um, I, I will, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So I'm just curious about those, those general, general fund questions. Okay, well, so I'll jump in with uh, the answer to the first few questions. Um, mm -hmm. So just the number of people that we were expecting to serve. Uh, well, we anticipated that $3 million would go towards uh, maybe 800, between seven and 800 uh, families. Um, based on the very early projections from the first day of applications, the first 24 hours, um, we anticipated that if the funds were used um, in the way that people were asking for at the time, then we would we had 600 applications and so we were anticipating, and that was only half of the money that we had dedicated to this. So 600 uh, applications using up to $1.5 million. So um, we're still waiting to figure out exactly how this is going to play out. I don't think um, that considering that we don't even know how long this crisis is going to last and whether or not we, um, people will need to try to access this funding again um, we're hoping that it will probably help um, far more than this, the seven, the original 700 that was projected. Um, the second question that you asked, uh, protections for tenants. Um, oh, I'm sorry also. So in that first, after that first iteration, we also then screened out tenants who were not from Boston. Mm -hmm. We've seen at least a third of those applications that have come in through the screening tool coming from people who are outside of the city, uh, whether they know Chelsea or Lynn or Lawrence are uh, not part of Boston. We've definitely been doing a, a zip code screen to ensure that the right, um, the, the, ac the resources are going to the right folks. The second question that you asked in terms of tenant protections to, um, and I think that really just pertains to whether a landlord is willing to uh, um, maintain the tenancy for a, for a tenant who accesses these funds. Um, I know that you had had some questions also about potential housing code violations that um, 
should landlords be allowed to access this money if they have housing code violations. We really just want to stress that this funding is really not directed um, towards 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 the landlord. It's it's not designed to uh, penalize the tenant based on the act the inaction of the landlord mm -hmm. um, or based on the fact that the landlord owns you know more than a certain number of units. So. Um, so just to be clear, the, the, the two questions were about uh, that um, on landlords, because it, it is, you are correct, we don't want to hurt a tenant through the landlord's inactions, 100% agree. But we also don't want landlords to make out on this moment due to the fact that people are desperate. And by that, I mean, if, is there, because there are limited funds, are you going to, and the landlord has, you know, 35 units, if they all qualify in this lottery and get through, are you going to have a cap saying, you know, maximum that a landlord can get is, you know, 15 or $12,000 or $20,000 from this fund. That's the, where that comes from because we have limited amount and I'm sure a lot of people and tenants threw over, but it's going to benefit one landlord. Um, the other tenant protection that I wanted to check in was the, um, this is free money from the city of Boston, right? This is, this is free money that they're getting. There's no payback back to the city of Boston. So as a result, I don't, I would like the city to consider what protections we can give to tenants. Um, luckily, hopefully the state house moves and stops the evictions. But um, what are we, what can we do for people who are on month to month leases? If they get this free money, why shouldn't we ask the landlord to at least commit to keeping them there for a year, not just when this pandemic ends. If they get this free money, why aren't we asking landlords to commit not to raise the rent, which even if they pass the state house bill, Landlords can raise the rent right now and continue to raise it. And that is a, that's a slow, painful eviction, right? So I'm asking why the city isn't and baking in those things. This is to stop, I, feel, I believe, a landlord windfall from getting monies uh, from the city. And, and, and st I, think of, I think the city would be absolutely embarrassed if we gave out money to landlords who then ultimately evicted people or ultimately raised their rents after the fact. So that's what I wanted to focus in on for landlord or tenant protection. Thank you for that question, Councilor Edwards. Um, we think there's some important questions you're raising about what we can do at this time to both increase the housing stability and the, and the uh, phys physical stability of households for renters. Uh, we need to review some of the ideas that you've presented. We do want to reiterate that we also don't want to put up any roadblocks to tenants getting this assistance in a timely fashion. And I also want to suggest that we are not going to be paying uh, landlords more than what they would have already gotten from the tenant. So this is a replacement of the income that they would have gotten from the tenant. So um, we don't expect any of them to get a, uh, a windfall. We also are capping the benefit for the individual household at 4,000, uh, which would also, I think, limit any potential windfall to a landlord. But we will, uh, go back to our agency and discuss some of the ideas you had in terms of what are the ways in which we could add tenant protections as part of this program. Thank you. I have, I, I did ask about the stimulus payments, but that's pretty granular. And I do know my other, especially Councilor Bach has a time limit. limit? So Sorry. I wanna, I'll go ahead and push on to the other uh, Councilor Councilor Edwards, I, can, I can answer that really quick for you on the stimulus payment. That's not actually screening people out yet. We still have an application that we've um, finalized and is being translated. So that's just the pre-screener question. It doesn't actually rule you out of the lottery. Okay. And um, when the lottery is actually done and they get their application from our vendor partners, um, mm -hmm. we are not actually calculating that as part of it, if that answers your question. If not, I can get you more information. That's helpful, thank you. Um, just before I turn it over to Councillor Flynn, um, when 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 will checks be issued? Our goal, and that's why we had the lottery ending at 12 p.m. tomorrow, was to make it make sure that um, our one of our vendor partners um, they get all their checks out on April 30th. Our goal is after the lottery is held on Monday to speed up that process. Their staff is waiting, all hands on deck, and they want to get the payments issued before May 1st. That's the goal right okay. now. Thank you. Before May 1st. Okay. Uh, Councillor Flynn. And again, this is on both topics. So he had uh, tenant protections and displacement. So just be prepared for both. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, I, 
I filed this hearing order was back in January to continue the conversation on ways to provide longer eviction notice periods to tenants following property transfers. And my proposal was based on using Boston's condo conversion ordinance as a, as a roadmap. Um, I stayed one of the most difficult rental markets in the country, Boston, but I'd like to see long-term residents of Boston who have been here longer than say five years uh, receive one year notice following a property transfer while our seniors, low income residents and persons with disabilities receive two year notices um, or, or, or maybe longer. Um, can you work with us on, on these issues? Yes, I'll jump in here. Um, I know that Councillor Edwards has been a part of the conversations that we've been having with uh, Greater Boston Legal Services to um, try to revise that uh, count, uh, condo conversion ordinance. Um, and so I know that there have been, there were conversations that had started um, in regards to that to try to increase some of the protections, increase the notice period, um, also increase maybe a, a buyout, a, a payout for tenants who are being displaced um, as a result of that. So those, do, those conversations definitely include OHS and they are ongoing. I don't know if Tim has something you want to add. Yeah, the, 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 what I'm hearing is say, for example, in, in Chinatown, I see a lot of development taking place all around the neighborhood, downtown Boston, the South Boston waterfront. Um, so these luxury buildings are going up, but my tenants, my constituents are being forced out. So I can't have one happening and then the other thing happening. You know, if we're going to be building these great buildings, that's fine. But keep these longtime residents, keep our elderly, keep our seniors, persons with disability, people on fixed income, seniors, our immigrant neighbors, keep them in Boston also. We can do both. Um, we can't just do put up these great buildings and then tenants are on their own. So, sorry, Councillor Flynn, I completely agree with you. And I've worked, uh, we've, our office has worked with your um, office on a lot of seniors being displaced through buildings being sold. And that's why one of the things that Office of Housing Stability has done is um, we send out building sold notices to anyone who's had a building sold in the city of Boston, if they're living in that and the tenant receives that. So they have some kind of idea of their rights and they're informed to contact our office if they have any issues with their new landlord. Um, but in addition to that, you know, they're really good ideas, uh, Councilor Flynn and Councilor Edwards, and you know, we have to protect our neighborhoods and we're willing to work with you on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and. Um, Councillor Flynn, just a point of um, clarification. You were correct in the uh, condo conversion was actually supposed to be part of this original conversation. Uh, we were gonna combine the two. Uh, so just for everybody else on, on the, the, the talk, we were gonna deal with a larger conversation and then deal with the condo specific, um, which needs to be renewed this year. We replaced that with the rent assistance because we, we needed to prioritize the conversations. Uh, so please note, we will be having a detailed uh, hearing on the condo ordinance specifically and the protections we will have to provide this year. Sorry, Councilor Flynn. No, th th thank, you, Edwards. thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. And I don't have any further questions. I, I do want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards for her work on this important issue for many years. I also want to thank Mayor Wall, Sheila Dillon's office as well, and your team for your work on this. Thank you for working closely with my staff on many issues. I do have some follow-up questions in some tenants, organizations, some um, organizations throughout the district have asked me questions. I'm just gonna forward those to you um, after the meeting and maybe we can get back together again um, uh, later on and we can answer some of these questions, but some of my residents in South Boston, Chinatown, the South End have asked questions. Um, and I know Karen Chen, who's from the Chinese Progressive Association um, is, on this, um, is on this call as well. And I'll, I'll also follow up with her, but again, I'm, gonna, I'm here to listen. So I just wanna say thank everybody for their leadership on this important issue. Thank you, Councillor. Lynn, and we'll be happy to get those questions from you. And we're also very much looking forward to a rich conversation 
about the condominium conversion ordinance because we do think it needs to be revised and renewed. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and turn over Councillor Bach. I know you have 10 minutes before you teach class, so <laughs> so yes, sorry. Thank you. I'll, I'll apologize in advance to everyone um, who makes remarks after three o'clock that I'll have to miss, but I will be watching um, the balance of the working session later. Um, just again, want to thank everybody here. I think, you know, this is a, a virtual room full of people who care quite a lot um, about keeping people housed um, and doing so with dignity and doing so in a way that allows people to take care of their economic needs in their life. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Dominique, if you look at that sort of cross section of the, not the what it was 4,600 or 4,400 um, folks who had applied by the end of yesterday um, for the rental relief fund, just curious if you could speak to on a kind of super initial screening, like how many of those people that you reference the fact that you folks think it makes sense to move to a lottery because you've got more more need than you can meet with the initial. Um, I guess to me that raises two sets of questions. Um, one is obviously, you know, how do we how do we find other resources to help um, support the folks who you know don't win the lottery? And then the other question, though, is sort of how big of a pool is that? Like, um, I know that one of the things we're considering with this fund is whether we think people are going to have those other resources to meet their need. Um, and so I'm curious if in your initial intake form, it looks like half the people are good candidates for the program as it was envisioned, um, a quarter, two thirds, like, you know, what's the, um, what would sort of fully funding it for filling that gap of the people who aren't served by other programs look like based on the demand thus far? I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we're still um, trying to do some analysis and we're hoping to learn best practices through that first round. Um, I think it's great that we're um, already seeing that we may be able to um, help more people than we initially thought that we would. Um, so that first round is going to be looking at, uh, the first round of funding is going to be, um, after that first round of funding, we're going to be trying to help to find protections for tenants in other ways. Of course, we're um, committed to pushing for legislation that will go for an eviction moratorium at the state house. Um, and then I think the big question though is really just how much more money are we going to be able to find within the city? And if there's going to be any additional federal or state funding that's gonna come. Um, So you don't have, but you don't have a clear sense yet of what sort of the breakdown of the applicants is in terms of like Not how many people you, and, and what's your, and presumably there is some screening decision you're making in terms of entering people into a lottery or are you leaving the lottery process to the vendors? No, uh, the city of, uh, I'll let Katie uh, and uh, Taylor speak a little bit more towards the specifics of the lottery process. But the screening tool is um, a way to just make sure that we're actually getting targeting the resources and allowing people to apply who aren't going to get that unemployment assistance, who aren't going to be eligible for um, any additional federal stimulus money, um, and people who are going to have a large gap between what they typically would be able to, to, to make and um, what that unemployment may make up. Uh, Councilman Bach, before I let Taylor explain um, kind of the lottery process that we have decided upon, I just wanted to say that you know we understand at D and D and OHS that we're never going to be able to meet the need, unfortunately, of all the renters in the city of Boston, and so that's why we just developed this to try and fill the gap as quickly as possible, which is why we have our vendors prepared to send money out quickly. Um, but I just want to let you know, um, we understand the need. We hear it all the time. We heard it before. Friday, I personally took over 100 phone calls on our hotline um, from constituents that are in need, and, and not just from Boston. And it's really um, unfortunate to make sure that those people don't fall through the cracks. We also send people who are from outside of Boston to resources that they might be able to access. So we're all hands on deck. And I just wanted to say that before Taylor explains the lottery. Okay. So for the lottery process, um, the only folks that are being screened out at this stage are folks mm -hmm. without uh, 
city of Boston zip code. Um, so that's something that we're paying really close attention to and looking over the pre-screening forms. Um, and so from there, all of those folks who have city of Boston zip codes will be entered into the lottery process. Um, and then actually the partner agencies and the application uh, form for those who are selected in the lottery um, will be verifying um, all of the responses that folks are submitting around kind of their, their income, both pre and post. Um, and then we have a number of other verifying documents that we'll be asking the partner agencies to walk through with folks um, and can provide additional details about kind of what the, if there are other questions about kind of how the lottery will work, can also answer those. Mm -hmm. So, so it's just for folks who don't have the Boston zip code that aren't getting into the lottery process. And do you have a sense yet of how many of those, of those families that have applied, how many get, get, get pulled out by that? So counselor, um, just really quick, when we screen them out for not having a city of Boston zip code, we email them. So they have five days to then appeal. And we've had people emailing back bills to show that they do actually live in the city of Boston. They had just typed in their zip code incorrectly. So we give them uh, another shot. And just to jump in there, that's about, um, so far, it's about a third of the applicants that we've wow. seen. So there's a lot of need, not just in Boston, but apparently also statewide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, sorry, and I, I think you said this, Dominique, but I might have missed it. What um, What's the sort of average need? Because obviously you said you're expecting to be able to serve a few more families than you thought. So unfortunately, um, one of the, the, the question about how much rent they actually need from us right now, that's not a required question to answer. So I can't give you an exact number on that, but I'd, I'd be happy to share that information with you um, offline when I get Okay. Yeah, I just think, I think that from a, from a city council perspective, um, I mean, sort of the reason for this line of questioning is, I mean, I do think we have to be realistic about what we as a city can do. But I think specifically, right, that uh, both on the administration side and on the council side, and I think this is true for Councillor Edwards as well, you know, there's many of us that are particularly concerned with the people who don't have access to these other resources. And I think that it's a really different conversation for the council and the administration if, you know, we have 3 million and, you know, when we really zoom in on the sort of targeted group of folks who aren't able to access other resources, what we need is five what we need right like is seven like you know or is what we need mm -hmm. 50 right because if right. there there's a scale there's a scale at which we can't like like you say i mean katie you're absolutely right we're not going to be able to meet all the need regardless and we all you know that's a hard thing to live with but it's a thing that we know and that's part of why we're pushing at every other level right now right state and federal um but i still think that within our program it's relevant to know like what's the what's the scale of the applications we're getting that are really in that gap space and um, and what would it take to sort of meet all of those? So I would just ask, I totally understand, you know, we're having this working session uh, four days after the application went live. So I know the data is like not all there, but I would just ask um, you folks as you're as you're looking through it to think about that and think about that as something you could report back to us on. Mm -hmm. So, oh, and uh, with, and with that, I'll, I'll conclude my questions and apologize again for having to jump off. Not a problem. Um, thank you so much for doing what you could do when you could do it, Councillor Bach. Um, Councillor Mejia. Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have a few questions. Uh, one um, is from an audience. I'm just um, trying to create opportunities for people to really be engaged in, in this conversation. Um, the question is um, in regards to how do you verify uh, the, how do you, ver let me give it to you. How do you, how do they verify the dollar amount for the rent to help with the rent, rental assistance? Like, so we'd be curious to hear about that. Um, and then I have some questions about the process. When I first heard about the relief fund, I was really excited to hear that we were going to be able to um, share another resource with our community. So thank you for putting the fund out. Um, initially, when we first heard about it, it was a first come first serve. Um, we uh, started sharing the links with everyone. Information started getting back to us that it was only in English. Um, I think it came, the link came out on the 6th and it wasn't until the 8th that we had um, 
the links in, in multiple languages. So there was like a two day delay there in terms of making sure that people from multiple languages were able to even take advantage of this. Um, I, because I'm an exponential learner, I have to go through the process alongside with others just to figure out what it looks like. I filled out the Google form and there were several things that were a little bit unclear to me. I brought it up to Sheila's team, but yes, um, but today I think it was, I received, or yesterday, yesterday I received a, a response stating that um, due to the high number of applicants that we were gonna move on to a lottery process, but there was no information about what are other resources that could be available to uh, someone like me in my situation. So I'm just wondering, like what, what is the backup plan um, and how can we um, be a, a little bit more cognizant of the fact that this type of communication to someone who's in need felt a little bit abrupt. So then how do we follow up with folks? Um, especially those who are now gonna be moving on to a lottery. I think that for a lot of people, that's a surprise to them um, because initially it was first come first serve. And then my other, my other question is um, what happens to those applicants uh, um, with this hard deadline now uh, this week um, who didn't tomorrow. have- Tomorrow, yeah. That's, yeah, my God, time is getting, Tomorrow, hello, especially for those who um, who are now just getting the links in their native language. Just wondering what um, what contingency plan is put in place for those um, for those folks. And thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah, thank you for that question. And I can get us started on the the application component in terms of the languages and when the different screening forms, excuse me, um, were available. So on Monday, the screening forms in English and Spanish by the end of the day uh, were posted on the Rental Relief Fund website. The uh, remaining languages of uh, Haitian Caper, or Caperian Creole, Haitian Creole, Vietnamese, Chinese uh, were posted on Tuesday by the end of the day. Um, so there was a, a staggered uh, upload of those of those screening materials, but at the same time, we were also helping folks complete uh, the screening form via phone. Um, so for folks who needed assistance completing that document, there were multiple pathways um, to, to make sure they were able to be part of the process. Um, we'll also start to speak to kind of the transition to a lottery process and other folks can chime in um, around uh, how we move towards that decision. Um, but we had had some uh, conversations with, with staff uh, within D&D and then also had been doing research um, with other cities who have established similar types of funds um, over the past couple of weeks um, who have also utilized a lottery system. Um, for some of the cities that we spoke to, they really emphasize that a lottery could be beneficial um, for folks uh, who perhaps were getting information later um, that they wouldn't be penalized for accessing the information later if it was uh, more of a lottery system as opposed to first come first serve. Thank you for that. Um, but I, I do have a quick follow up, but I don't know, Madam Chair, if that's how it works. Is it just... if you, yep. And then I'm going to go on to uh, the other counselors, but go ahead with a quick follow up. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it, what it feels like to me, um, and I don't know if this is the best analogy, but it feels like the Hunger Games. Now people are on this rush to fill out applications to, to be served. I'm just still curious about what, um, what feedback can we offer uh, folks who, who are not able to um, win this lottery? Mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do for those constituents? And I still need some answer around the verification process. So uh, just really quick, just to let you know, our whole goal is to make sure people don't fall through the cracks. I track all the cases and emails that come in carefully. I know exactly how many emails have been responded to. Right now at DND, we have three looks on each case that comes in. So whenever we receive an email to housing stability, that creates a case. And now three different people are looking at it to make sure that that person didn't fall through the cracks. So we have a lot of people working on this to make sure that people get the answers that they need. We've um, engaged staff from across DND that are multilingual speakers to get back to people if one of the requirements is to have an email address to fill out the application so we actually have staff fill it out for them online and use our housing 
stability at boston.gov email. We came up with a system to make sure that whenever there's updates to the people who did not have email addresses, because they wouldn't receive an auto email like you did, Counselor Mejia, that we will call them and let them know in whatever language they filled out the form, what's going on in the lottery. So they're updated at all times. So it's been a um, logistical uh, circus a little bit, but we, we made it work from a remote, like all over the city we're working on this. So um, I, I do want to just let you know that we are trying to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Mejia. Is Councilor O'Malley still here? He may have had to step away. He may come back. I'm going to go to Councilor Asab. No, no? okay. Councilor Asabi George. Thank you, uh, Chair um, Edwards and Thank you to my colleagues for their questions. I've been tuning in and out, so I do not want to repeat a question that was already asked, so I'll make sure to review and follow up with questions afterwards. But I do want to thank, um, I think it's Taylor and Katie and Dominique in particular for being present because OHS is really doing an, an amazing amount of work right now. So just thank you to them in particular. Tim, sorry, you too. Uh, but thank you, Chair Edwards. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Braden? Um, I have no questions. I have to jump off to take a call, make a call. So I will ju jump back in again uh, as I'm able very soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, I have some follow-up questions, but I'd rather get to the uh, folks who are here. Um, I have only three hands raised, which means only three people want to talk, which just doesn't seem, just doesn't seem yeah, I, I highly doubt that. So uh, I am going to encourage folks in this kind of time to raise your hands um, because I, uh, what happened on this system is it went by alphabetical order, not by how you arrived. And so there, you know, it's not really indicated. Oh, here comes six people. Okay, good. Okay, so six people want to speak. Um, but in the meantime, there are two people we did invite um, to also speak a little uh, ahead of time before um, we put out the link. So I wanted to go ahead and go to uh, Karen Chen and Lauren Song. And also there are a lot of people who signed on, which is great through their cell phones or through uh, nicknames, which are funny, um, but it's hard. So we can name your nickname if you if you don't mind, but there's some some someone signed in with a period or dot. I don't know if that's the name, but either way, it, it's if you want to be called on, please uh, rename yourself so we have a name to actually say. That's just it's literally an administrative. Uh, it's not easy for me and central staff to coordinate who speaks next. So uh, please rename yourself. And then I see I have six hands raised, so I'm going to go based off of them. But in the meantime, um, count. I'm sorry. Uh, Karen Chen, if you're ready, and then uh, Lauren Song. So if we can unmute Karen Chen from CPA. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you, counselors, um, for holding this hearing and um, you know bringing us together in this difficult time. And I just have a couple questions around, um, reiterate the point around uh, the cap um, for different landlords. I, I, I might have missed the detail on whether or not there was, um, you know, a limit on, you know, uh, large property owners, like something like, you know, I think it, I may have heard six or more, they shouldn't be, we should have a priority on, on small property owners. Um, that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And, um, and then also the other thing too, is like when we are looking at kind of, you know, with an equity lens and also, you know, we should actually figure out what are we going to do with properties um, that has LLCs? Cause we know that uh, in the world of speculation, um, sometimes LLCs are used to disguise um, the owners. And then actually on the other hand, I feel like there are uh, property owners will be able to help, you know, tenants with some of these applications. And I actually hope that I don't know, um, you know, there's limited resources. And um, we were only able to get like, um, with lots of help from the staff, you know, we were able to get three people um, from Chinatown to apply. I don't know how many other people were able to apply on their own. We shared it. Um, but, you know, I wonder if, um, 
you know, there, if, if there is another round, I wonder if it's something that where we, um, you know, having requirements on no rent increase, but also encourage collaborations between landlords and tenant, because actually ultimately this money will go to the landlord and help them, you know, pay um, for uh, the mortgages. And I think that they should pitch in to help, you know, the vulnerable um, tenants. Um, I think that no matter how you, you know, um, you know, calculated, we have, you know, homeowners have barriers and challenges, but tenants are at more disadvantage. And that we want to save tenants at home, but also this really, you know, goes to the pocket of um, the landlords. And, and I hope that this is a way to also encourage them to work with their tenants more and support them more in other ways as well. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know if anyone from the administration wanted to respond to that. Uh, before I think, I'm gonna check, is, is Lauren still here? Lauren Song from GBLS? Okay. All right, anyone from the administration wanna speak? or respond very quickly? Sure, I know, uh, Karen, thank you very much for your question. I know um, we have a conversation that we're supposed to have at 4.30 today with uh, yourself and a couple of other folks to talk a little bit more about um, the fund. Um, so I, I will certainly follow up with your question there as well. Um, as you know, all of the services that the Department of Neighborhood Development, OHS, um, offer are always available to constituents. Um, we certainly encourage people to check, both to check on our website as well as to reach out to us if they're having challenges with their landlord. I know that did come up also, I think earlier this week, the conversation with Moya. Um, not every tenant has a great relationship with their, their landlord or feels comfortable providing information about their landlord's address or, um, and of, so of, of course that's something that we'll still continue to explore and address. Um, since this is such a new program and we're still trying to figure out exactly how to um, coordinate both the effort as well as um, incorporating it with the work that we do in, on a regular basis, um, that's something that we'll still continue to explore. But we do have a mediation program also between tenants and landlords. We've seen a lot of landlord tenant questions roll in, even not necessarily just related to the rent, but um, you know, just COVID related questions that tenants have had um, come in and we've been able to refer those to our mediator who's always on staff. So I look forward to continuing the conversation um, in that regard. Thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one last call for Lauren. And if she's not here, I'm gonna go to the hands that are raised so far on my end. I'm um, just gonna do that real quick. Okay, so uh, the folks who raised their hand. I, I'm assuming it's Gabriela Cartagena. I have Gabriela. Yes. Hey. Okay. Go ahead, um, Gabriela. So I actually just want to repeat the concerns around of around the inequitable un, unequal access to language for this application, um, and share also that the piece of information about this becoming a lottery process and applications closing Friday at 12 p.m. haven't been posted until today in the other languages, um, which now gives people a little over 24 hours to act quickly for, until Friday, 12 p.m. Um, second is my concern around this being a lottery process. Is there any way to filter out or filter certain more vulnerable people to be considered for the final lottery process, right? Because I did hear you say, um, those from the House Office of Housing Stability, that the purpose is to s serve those most vulnerable. But if it's all mixed in together, how are you even, you know, prioritizing those like community members who need it? Um, my second is, my second question and our concern, consideration, whatever, sorry, <laughs> I'm just upset, um, is how, the, I know there are many homes, there are certain applicants who don't have a designated household leader, um, a designated household member, um, and a lot of these homes don't have leases. So for the actual second step, um, how is that potential obstacle going to be overcome, or is that, is that something you could consider um, 
or I don't know, surpass when if these community members don't have leases. Um, my second concern, um, kind of like echoing Kathy, is how do we make sure that we're not, you know, giving that we're not aiding giving this money for corporations. Like, how do you make sure that this money is actually prioritizing landlords that actually live in those homes, right? There are actually like local owners who are at higher risk of being displaced of a potential foreclosure, no? Um, and my second, my other concern is since the application was only provided in English for the first day until the end of that business day, a lot of people who don't speak English apply for that application so in English. So how are you going to mitigate calling back these people and how much time are those people gonna have to wait for you to look for a designated um, native speaker to call them back? Um, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Excellent questions. Um, any, you know what, uh, Gabriella, just if it's okay, I might ask this someone else else ask some questions and have the admin. Um, is that okay? Gabriella? Sounds good. Okay. Um, because after you, we have, um, I had John Walkie. If you wanted to add to those questions, so they, we just kind of group them together so that the administration could answer them. But I also wrote them down too. John? Sure. Um, I guess my question is in relation to uh, the undocumented community. Uh, Tim had uh -huh. mentioned uh, concerns about uh, reaching out to them. Uh, and in particular, it's kind of a, a sensitive uh, issue in terms of you know, going up to a mailbox in East Boston and seeing a thousand names on one triple decker because you've got um, people who are not necessarily, and looking through the application form, you put in the name of your landlord chances are many of these families are paying somebody who is a sub, sub, sub letter. Um, a lot of the, these are people who are undocumented. They're living outside of sort of the formal uh, legal system. And in some ways, some of the, um, I mean, it's a sensitive issue because there are probably some violations of, of different ordinances in terms of packing a house full of people. Uh, but if you have a three bedroom apartment and a triple decker, chances are you've got three families, one in each of those bedrooms, mm -hmm. and somebody is paying somebody else who's paying somebody else. Um, it's gonna be very difficult to get the name of the person, um, even getting through the language barriers and getting people comfortable to filling out something online and convincing them that, no, if you fill this out online, immigration's not going to come to your door. Um, it's still, I don't think they have the answers to many of these questions. So I'm afraid that um, I, I I know that everybody is doing their best and is trying to make sure that people do not fall through the cracks, but the reality is I think there's going to be a number of families, undocumented families, um, and at least from my experience in East Boston, that will most likely be going through those cracks at a pretty rapid rate. So I'm not sure what we can do to try to figure out the best way um, to make sure those folks are able to stay, stay in the homes that they're in. No, leave it there. Thank you. Um, I know that there might be a time crunch for some of the folks who are on the phone from the administration. So I'm gonna have you go ahead and answer these questions and then we'll group the next two people who have their hands raised, okay? So someone wanna to respond to the questions regarding language, regarding undocumented immigrants, time. Sure. Um, I can just briefly touch on a couple of the issues and I'll um, let someone else respond to some of the other questions if I didn't address them. Um, you know, we found the money quickly last week and we just wanted to get this fund announced. And so our focus has been on the work of this fund um, and we, we know that there's that need out there. So that was our main focus. And I know that some people might fall through the cracks and that, you know, is on us, but we're definitely working as hard as we can to make sure that nobody falls through the cracks and that this is a fair and equitable process. And um, we know that the information has been spotty, but we're trying to get everything out to people. So we are trying to communicate as soon as people apply, we have three or four touches with them. And that's our, our main goal. Um, if people have problems with the application, they should call our office and we will help them fill it out or answer any questions that they have about what might be asked and what documents might be needed. We've been in full consultation with our nonprofit partners who have a long history in these communities, uh, undocumented communities and um, the like. 
And, you know, they've looked at everything that we're trying to do and they've, they've approved it and, and given us input on in the whole process. So we're definitely trying to loop everyone in. So this is successful. We just want to get it going and make sure that the money gets out quickly to folks because we understand that there's, there's a lot of need. Um, there was uh, specifically about the undocumented community having sub sub letters and not knowing who the landlord is. How do you protect them? If they apply. How do you verify that the person is a landlord, I guess, is one thing. And then how do you make sure that it's going when the check gets written, that it's going to actually protect the person who needs it? Yeah, so can start to, to speak to some of that answer and can provide some additional uh, information uh, perhaps after this. But one of the things that uh, we made sure to include in the application document, which uh, Katie referenced that um, we uh, had a number of folks review is offering um, some different options in terms of um, what's what uh, applicants could share in terms of a uh, written lease agreement in terms of um, what documentation um, would be accepted to, to show uh, residency in a particular building. Um, so we wanted to be really thoughtful about giving folks a number of options um, if they didn't have a kind of formal event that there were other ways they could they could show that for the um, undocumented component uh, I think part of, of what I just talked about starts to address that um, but it's a population that we're incredibly concerned about and want to make sure that we aren't putting additional barriers um, in place in order for them to to uh, receive funds for this program. Um, I'm going to go ahead to the next person who has some, um, unless John or Gabriella, if you felt, is there something you wanted to add or if there was something you wanted to emphasize? There, and I just want to be clear, there's many questions um, there's that we need to hammer out and I will be emailing several to the folks in the city and we will schedule a working session. So that's a follow-up conversation on this exact fund. So this is not, this doesn't end today. The questions don't end today. The concerns don't end today because the crisis doesn't end today, right? We understand that the folks at the city of Boston are doing, I truly believe they're doing their best to try and, and deal with this as it is happening in the most extreme time with a lot of variables. That being said, uh, that's, uh, there, there's lessons that we can learn as we're also going along. And luckily the, you know, the folks here at OHS and Tim have demonstrated the nimbleness, the intelligence and the heart to be able to adjust, to, 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 to critically look at what's being done and to improve on it. I know that from personally working with them when I was at the city, but also from working with them now as a politician. So I wanna give them that credit. Um, this is a, an attempt to create a true team between the city, between the politicians, and between the grassroots organ organizers and the everyday Bostonians to figure out the best way to make this program work, to get to the people who are most vulnerable, and to also find additional funds, because we all agree that $3 million is not enough. It is not enough, we need more money. $5 million has been committed. So I, I'm saying this so that people don't feel that this is over with in the terms of this uh, conversation, in terms of us being creative, in terms of us being nimble, okay? I understand that there, you know, we, I had wanted to talk about other funds from CPA that will not happen very likely today. I understand um, some of you guys from the city may have to leave. So we're gonna continue to com have conversations and figure our way out of this together. We are in a crisis and, and we understand that. So I just wanted to say that to everybody. Um, to, um, there are some additional folks with hands raised and I wanted to get to them. Um, uh, before I, before we continue, if I could say this quickly, thank yes. you for your comments, Councillor Edwards. Um, and also, yes, uh, we do, most of us do have to jump off to kind of proceed with working on this and the other programming we're doing. Um, Neil from the IGR will remain here and can bring up any questions or comments to us. Okay. We have three, uh, we have two more people to just ask quick questions, if that's okay, Andreas and Cortina Van, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Andreas. Uh, or, yes, hi, thank you, thank you, Councillor Edwards. Uh, so first of all, just thanking Councillor Edwards uh, for having this hearing for us and the rest of the council. 
um, as well as those from the administration participating. Also, a thank you for the, the nimbleness and quick response in establishing this fund in the first place. Um, I kind of just want to preface my, my commentary and questions with saying that I think the fund is a great opportunity to capture data in real time about who has a need right now. However, I do think we should understand or, or, or live in the context that the court systems are largely not functioning. And so it gives us an opportunity to implement uh, the disbursement of the funds in, in as strategic a way as, uh, as we can. And for that, I just want to. I, I infer that I just want to uplift what the counselor has mentioned on uh, making this or trying to ensure that this is not a corporate bailout for large corporate landlords, which I think has been echoed by others. I think that's a very, very important piece in East Boston. We have a long tradition of having small homeowners that actually keep their units affordable because they want to keep the neighborhood the neighborhood, and we as a city should be uplifting those landlords and, and making sure that 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 these small homeowners. Um, are protected and, and really feel the, the benefits of this fund as opposed to large corporate landlords. Um, I, yeah, I think to myself, like, what could that look like? And I wonder if that could look like larger disbursements or the opportunity for their tenants to reapply to the funds it, should they find themselves in this situation the next month uh, or a higher priority settings for live-in landlords, landlords that live in the same building as the tenants that are applying. Um, and so, you know, I wonder how we can center some of the, the community aspect of our neighborhoods um, and, and the fact that we do have landlords that actually live in our neighborhoods, live in our communities and contribute in that way. Um, I also just wanna uplift that I, I see the lottery system as an opportunity to inform people about other resources. So whilst I don't think that the lottery, I mean, it's a lottery, not everybody's gonna win the lottery. Um, and so there is an opportunity there to send people back a list of resources such as Raft and others. And I haven't heard whether or not that's occurring. So I'd love to hear more about whether that's happening or going to happen. Um, and and uh, I, I just wanna you know, raise also in the context that you know, this pandemic and the economic pressures it's creating really is just exposing the vulnerability that our city um, was in for this because of the, the hyper speculation and overdevelopment in our city and how that has really lent itself to be very, very exposed um, to, to this kind of economic pressure. Uh, and so I think moving forward, I hope that one of the lessons we're learning is that housing stability is critical um, for the vitality and the economic stability of our, of our city as a whole uh, for when crises occur. Um, and then I also just lastly want to uplift members of the community that I know, members of City Life that have been trying to get on this call and um, don't speak English. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just want to just for the future uplift the Zoom has an interpretation function and I look forward to um, seeing these meetings uh, be able to occur in, 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 in multiple languages. Andreas, thank you so much. Um, I did not know about that function, so I apologize for my ignorance. Uh, that will not happen again. And I apologize. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Councillor Edwards. No, we, we are very thankful that this hearing is occurring. Uh, so. No, and also just wanted to emphasize myself, I'm sure Councillor Mejia, Councillor Flynn, or anybody else who you would want to talk to subsequently will we'll happily set up a separate audience with anybody about this um, it, in more than one language. I think we're all committed to that. I'm sure also, I don't want to speak on behalf of the city, but I'm sure the city will also make itself available if needed to in another Thank form. Um, uh, Ms. Cortina Van? Cortina? We're just going to have to get you um, off. That, there you are. All right. There you are. Um, thank you so much, um, Councillor Edwards and uh, Councillor Flynn and all the city councils for the opportunity to, to be here today to, to talk with you and our other community partners um, and the administration. Um, it has been refreshing to be able to, for our Maha members um, and our staff to work with Councillor Edwards in, in helping working class families and, and individuals who are low income and low to moderate income. Um, I'm a resident here in Dorchester and I'm also um, organizer for Maha Mass Affordable Housing Alliance. And so I just wanna thank Councillor Flynn for initiating a hearing to support tenant evictions and displacement. And wanna thank Councillor Edwards for, re for the recommendation to um, have a temporary rental assistance support for residents um, impacted by the COVID-19. Uh, we are definitely at Maha and our, with our members in the community in favor of much needed rental assistance. 
And we want to applaud uh, the mayor and his housing administration for the $3 million rental relief fund. Um, one of the things we strongly believe that the proposed CPA funds for programs like the um, Acquisition Opportunities Program and the One Plus Boston are real important and they shouldn't be taken away to fund another important housing program. Um, we are excited at Maha uh, um, for the One Plus program along with hundreds of first time home buyers who are taking um, these first time home buyer classes with agencies all across this, uh, the city. And this program is going to give folks an uh, opportunity to have access and opportunity to buy in Boston for folks who want to stay here in Boston. Uh, so this program is going to um, really help us obtain long term stability and helps us in crushing the racial homeownership gap. It's going to help us with displacement in this fight to, to help with this displacement that's happening. So I know it's, it's just really uh, frustrating on how we're in this process with this pandemic and in the midst of that, we just all want to use all the necessary tools that we do have to help as many families and individuals as possible. We want to give people a variety of different tools um, and uh, to be able to help them. So we're definitely going to be um, in, in this together and we look forward to continuing to work with you and all the other counselors, uh, the mayor, um, your ho the housing administration, and all our other partners in the city of Boston. And I just thank you for that opportunity. I know you're probably gonna to have to, for the issue of time, probably have further conversation. I appreciate the fact of you having a working session to talk about how we can make sure this is an equitable process. And when we were talking about who are able to get the resources, but definitely look forward to further conversation in regards to funding sources. I think we wanna to try to have as many tools as possible um, and probably can get into this a little bit more later, but thank you for this opportunity um, to be able to share that. Thank you so thank much. And I do wanted to, I wanted to turn it over to the administration real quick with another question. Karen Chen just sure. texted me. And that was uh, with regards to if a person's in a household and their family members found to be positive or they themselves are found to be positive. She's wondering if there's any way that this, this program could be expanded or we could look at ways to provide temporary funding if that person needs to leave the home to go someplace else. Um, you, you know, I just wanted to put it out there. There are a lot of people who are gonna be in this situation, especially grandmother's po is not positive. Me as a young caretaker, I am positive. I live with my grandmother. What are we gonna do? Um, so is there a temporary hotel stay that the city might consider? I know we've done hotel stays, you know, for fires and things like that. So I just wanted to put that out there to add to the question or comment from um, Cortina and Andres. So this, this is Tim Davis. Um, that's a very interesting question and situation that is, is likely to come up. I think this is one where the staff at the Office of Housing Stability and at the vendors who are working with us, that we would wanna have a conversation probably with our um, supportive housing division because they are working more on the front lines of those families and households that, that are experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness. And they're working kind of on that those problems. So even if the family is not potentially homeless, I think under the what we're doing here now, we would want to operate as if we need to meet that emergency need and figure out what to do with how to help that family. Thank you. Um, anyone wanted to speak to the funding? Any thoughts about CPA at this point? Um, I see, so I'm going to ask when I, I apologize, there's an app on this to raise your hand. And then I also see Michael Kane is physically raising his hand. So <laughs> if you could try. And because I, I have to scroll through the screen to see everybody. So the when you click raise your hand on this app, it pops up immediately on my screen, no matter who, where you are, am I? I see you, Michael Kane. I'll Council, put your name down. Say, I have to go. I just want to say bye and thank you again for holding this hearing. And you know, please be in touch. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to continue until we finish at least the questions, and we'll send them over to you guys at the administration if you have to leave and then save them also for a working session to continue to discuss this program. Thanks, thank you so much, Dominique Williams. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Thank you so much, Tim, if you have to go. Appreciate that you all came. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, I have, let's see, just making sure I have a, so, um, 
Anybody else want to raise their hand? I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, Michael Kane, and then I'm going to look physically. Keep your hand up if you want to speak so I can see. And if you don't have your camera on, I can't tell. So I see Michael Kane. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, first, I, I just want to say uh, uh, this okay. is really heroic uh, what uh, the DND people and the council are doing uh, under these ex incredible circumstances. And uh, uh, really appreciate all your leadership. Um, I'm concerned about the, the fact that, you know, there are what I hear is 4,500 people applied, about 3,000 are from Boston. Uh, and that's just by uh, in a few days. Obviously, it's the tip of an iceberg, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, only about 1,200 can be funded with the 3 million. So, obviously, there needs to be more money. Um, Tim had mentioned that the city is due to get uh, 20 million from emergency service and 25 million from CDBG. My questions are uh, Are those uh, funding sources fungible? Could they be used to expand this pot? You'd need another 9 million, I think, just to deal with everybody who's already qualified on the lottery. Um, and then there were, if you open, if you kept it open, obviously there's going to be a lot more. And then there's next month. So this is um, clearly the federal source would be best. Can you use that? And can a, a related question, can you, if people are turned down from the lottery, can they be told you'll be on a wait list as soon as more money is available or something like that? Um, so those are questions. Um, the, uh, I also want to reinforce what Andres and uh, Gabrielle, I think, said about prioritizing owner occupants so that the money doesn't go to these corporate landlords like City Realty. There's a house next door to me here. Um, and uh, another question, can you, all things being equal, can this, as a city thought about prioritizing lower income people, people with the lowest incomes um, within this lottery system? Uh, the federal proposal uh, that we're hoping to get revived uh, uh, in the House Democrat proposal uh, set aside $100 billion for this, uh, of which 50% was for people below 50% of the media and the rest were up to 80%. It's like a temporary universal voucher program. It's not happening yet. Uh, we all need to work to make it happen. But I wanna, just wanted to ask about how to expand the pool uh, now to deal with all the people who clearly need it. Thank you, Michael. Um, I did want to address the concerns, um, but before I did anything, I would make sure with my colleagues if they had anything to say. Councilor Flynn or Councilor Mejia, I had a question, but, and Councilor Sabi George. So uh, Flynn, and did you have anything to say? I apologize, Councilor Mejia, but go ahead, Councilor Flynn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Um, I know I heard some comments earlier on language access. Mm -hmm. That's an issue that I've focused on probably more so than any other issue over the last two and a half years. Um, so I will follow up with the administration and, and with my colleagues as well. But we can only do our job effectively if all of our constituents, constituents can understand the city programs or state programs. So language access has to be a critical part of any discussion about city issues or state issues. And I just wanna let people know, I have, a, I have staff that work for me that speak Cantonese, Mandarin and Spanish. Please know that you can call my office or email my office and we'll get back to you right away. Uh, but language access is probably the most important issue, I think facing our city, we're an immigrant city. And I wanna say thank you to my colleagues on the Boston City Council. I wanna say thank you to the mayor's office, but especially thanking the neighborhood people mm -hmm. that are on this call that are living in our neighborhoods that understand the critical role language plays. And you might not be an elected official, you might not work for the city, but you're, the work you're doing is as critical as the work that we're doing. So I just wanna say thank you to the uh, residents of Boston for taking this issue very seriously. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Mejia? Yes. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two things. I, one is um, Gabriella, I guess, was uh, the one who was speaking, um, really made a good point, And I want to drive that point home again, which is what was part of my own remarks. Um, what opportunities do we have to change the deadline so mm -hmm. that we can ensure that those who, who need it most have a fair chance at applying for this. Um, I, I wanna reiterate that uh, I think that it's something that given these times that we may need to have a little bit of flexibility around this. And then the other um, piece is again, this is another question from my virtual audience that is tuning in um, with us um, is how do we, how do we, how do they, um, the city, track landlords to make sure that they don't receive double payments both rents from tenants and mortgage assistance. So that is the question. I'm not sure who can answer it, but this is another question that came from our Facebook feed. Um, so curious about that. And then the other question that we received online is about um, how do we, how do we uh, capture people who are renting rooms? Um, uh, there are some folks who, you know, in order to keep their uh, rental payments and, and being able to afford the rent, they're renting out rooms. Um, if you have a three bedroom apartment, yep. you can rent out a spare room. What does that look like is another question that we received online. So just curious about uh, those uh, two uh, points. Those are excellent points. Um, Councilor Abby George. Uh, thank you, no questions at this time. I've been in and out, so I don't wanna take any time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Councilor. I'm gonna to add uh, to the, the questions I had, but I also wanna address counselor, or I'm sorry, I keep calling you counselor Christina Van. Um, might be a, an omen, who knows? Maybe you should, <laughs> you, hey, I keep calling you counselor. Um, but I did wanna say that we 99.999% we, we agree on everything, except this one time <laughs> where I had called to look at the CPA funds. Um, and I want to be clear to the folks on the online still um, why I did that. I think I demonstrated I absolutely support the AOP program, Acquisition Opportunity Program, and I absolutely have made a commitment as a city councilor to the 1,000 homeowners in five years. As you recall, I did that publicly. I have my pie dish still. I was at Maha, and I have been a, a friend and, and, and a stalwart supporter down to the linkage that we're also praying gets passed, all of those things. And the reason why I looked at these two uh, linkage payments or linkage, uh, excuse me, these two CPA funds is because of the $24 million, several of those monies are going to specific housing projects and I do not want to touch them. But $8 million of CPA funds, which is a fund uh, that we pay on a quarterly basis, we pay into that. So it can be replenished. That's one of the reasons why I think looking at CPA makes sense because it can be replenished easier than say the neighborhood housing trust, which is on linkage payments, which can be stretched out over seven years. And I don't know who's gonna be making those payments depending on a downturn in the economy. But every quarter we pay our property taxes and every quarter we get more CPA funds. So that's why I looked to that. I said, okay, I know that this money's gonna keep coming in I know that you can bond on CPA money, which we haven't done. So I'm thinking flexibility. I'm mm -hmm. thinking there's about eight, and then the $8 million specifically that I'm looking at is for program funding to go back to DND to one to be available for applicants one day. And I remember thinking of the, you know, not all of it. I didn't want to take all $8 million. I initially proposed just taking $2 million. So one, from each of the programs, which would have left $6 million for the, the ultimate goals of that. But, but I do think it's worth being on the table to say of those flexible funds that we can bond on, that we can look at for the extreme pain that so many people are in right now, yeah. we should look at taking some of them. And I, I stand by that still, taking some of them. Um, and trust me, d and put in three, the Neighborhood Housing Trust put in five, so that we're moving different sections and different amounts of money. So I think it is worth examining whether CPA should also be putting in some as well. 
And that, that's why I initially proposed it. Again, 99.999999% Cortina. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to be clear about what, where, my, where my mindset was with that. Okay. I appreciate you um, uh, Ignan, talking about that. And, and I think that's the beauty of the CPA, the fact that, that we have the opportunity where to ref replenish funds. Um, but looking at the way it's structured now, with, like you said, 99% of where the program is now, because I've been fortunate enough to be working with a group of folks and, and, a, and a group of folks who are like the lenders who are in that process now of mm -hmm. getting that one plus out. And we're looking at May for it to hit the ground for folks. And there's so many people who are, who initially would be able to utilize this like now and it's coming out and wanna make sure that the funds are there to help people. Cause you're looking at something that's gonna keep people in the market who are working class families. And so this CPA having that flexibility as it's stated in the docket um, where you have that example from MHP and it's been used in, as rental assistance and it's definitely that opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. um, I just, just want to just, uh, emphasize the fact that for the program now, as it's kind of going to be coming out soon, talking about in a couple of weeks, that funding is important because that'll be in place for folks to utilize that. Even in the midst of this, this pandemic that we're in, folks, home buyers are, you know, have that option if there's that long-term stability and folks can utilize it based on where they are, because we know people are in different places, that mm -hmm. can get some people in a stable place that they won't be in jeopardy. And if that's an opportunity and a tool and option for folks, that we definitely gonna want to work together with you continuously to make sure that happens and then mm -hmm. find that way to make sure that um, having that rental relief there and looking at the CPA because it can be used and that's the beauty of the flexibility of the program. And like you said, there's that replenishment of that. I think it's a time and a place for everything and, and, and being strategic and we wanna work with you to, to make sure that happens so we can help as many people get that rental relief and then also the option for home ownership to get that stability and the, mm -hmm. with the racial home ownership gap. So we definitely want to continue to work to do that. Absolutely. So let's, let's make it happen. We're going to do it. We'll, we'll talk about bonding then. And for those who don't know what bonding means, it's basically used uh, borrowing in advance of receiving the money because it is replenished. So maybe that's an option too. The city say, we're not going to take from this funding round, but we're going to borrow from a couple funding rounds in advance um, if, if, they, if they apply. So um, thank you so for, much. You're welcome. I'm going to do one last scroll through for hands to come up. If people haven't spoken yet, I don't see too many people actually on screen. Um, I want to thank you all for participating in today's uh, hearing. It again is the beginning of a conversation. It's that rare moment that we can actually be part of helping to design, influence, and impact a program as it's being unfolded. That's how I see this. And again, I give credit to the city or to the city administration for being that flexible, to be, for being that nimble to get it going this fast. Uh, but there were some hiccups that we, I think we highlighted with the um, interpretation, with the language, and also just some things we want to be cognizant of happening. You know, a landlord getting that lives in Sudbury that has 35 units here, um, getting checks over a landlord who lives here with their tenants and is maybe trying to offer some relief to that tenant. Also, any landlord that gets free money from the city of Boston should, I think, make the basic commitment that they will not evict their tenants after this pandemic and that they will not raise the rent. I think those are two commitments that the city should be looking at in terms of protection for the tenants. At least look at it. So I think we can, uh, we, what I'll do is keep this, these matters in um, my, the committee. We will schedule a working session uh, so that as these ch checks are rolled out, we'll be able to also talk about how that rollout happened and uh, later this month, very likely in early May. So thank you all so much for, um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, and I really appreciate it. Councilor Flynn or Councilor Mejia, if you have any closing remarks. I just want to I just want to say thank you to you, Councilor Edwards, and to my colleagues on the City Council. Say thank you to the Mayor's office and and his team, and especially thanking the residents of Boston, these tenant organizations, tenant activists that have been working on this issue for 30, 40, 50 years. So Boston is a strong city because of your leadership, dedication, and commitment. So. I just want to say thank you to those uh, fighting for social and economic justice in our city. Um, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Mejia? 
Oh, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn uh, for co-hosting this hearing. Um, I also wanna thank uh, the activists. I think that, you know, I always see this conversation as an inside outside game in terms of really moving policy forward. So having you all join um, and uplifting the issues that we hear every day in and out um, really helps us with our advocacy. So just wanted to, to thank you all for your consistent um, work out in these streets. Um, and I am really looking forward to uh, getting some resolution around this April 10th deadline. And I don't know what we can do if anything given the final hour, but I do believe that the city has an opportunity to put in another provision of uh, like, we may have missed the boat on this go first go round. First go round. We, this is how we're going to rectify that situation for the next go round um, so that we can right the wrong. And I'm really pushing for that and hoping mm -hmm. um, to see that type of follow-up um, come, come through. Um, on behalf of our, our those who need it most. So, so thank you for hosting this and I look forward to continuing the dialogue um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor um, Asabi George, any closing oh, remarks? You. Thank you again, Chair. And um, I just, I do appreciate everyone's time. You know, we know that we're doing this work in response to the general housing crisis here in the city of Boston. And we're talking about it today in particular because of the impacts of um, the housing crisis added to the challenges that COVID-19 has brought to our city. So I appreciate your leadership in getting this hearing um, to happen. And I also appreciate those from the administration who are here today to talk about their work and the, the work that lies ahead. But I'm most, um, most happy to have the advocates here with us talking about their work because um, we may be technically working from home, which is sort of a weird thing to talk about when we're talking about housing vulnerability and lack of stability for many families, but the advocates continue to do this day in and day out. It does not matter um, whether there's um, a medical and public health crisis or That's not. Right. So thank you all, um, Cortina, Michael, and that, that's why I can see on my monitor right now, all of you for your steadfast dedication to this aside from this public health crisis. So thank you and thank you again, Chair and, and Councillor Flynn for your leadership in this matter. Thank you. I just wanna acknowledge Councillor Wu was here briefly. I, I don't know if she still is, but she did sign in uh, for a little bit. If she's not, Councillor Wu going once, twice. Okay, Councillor Braden. Hi, um, I just want to thank uh, the chair for this very important hearing. Um, I missed a chunk of the conversation with the advocates. I'm sorry about that, but I was talking to other housing advocates offline. Um, so I really feel that we had a crisis before this crisis. Mm -hmm. So we've got a crisis on top of a crisis and the work just intensifies. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and I look forward to putting my shoulder to the wheel and doing what I can to help the situation. Thank you so much. Thank you all so very much for coming out here today. I just wanted to again echo that this is the beginning of a conversation. We will make sure that the working session is interpreted as well. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that mistake on my part um, that Andreas noted that the, um, <clears throat> the hearing was not interpreted. And I will make sure that we have that and figure out what that app is to make sure that going forward, actually, I think all of the city councilors will figure out what that app is for all further conversations. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna close out this hearing on dockets 0218 and 0587. Thank you all for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>